bet the board. What do you mean you don't bet? I mean, I don't bet. You know, I don't care. I don't. Wizard. I never have, and I never will. Yeah, right. I'll bet you 20 bucks I can get you gambling before the end of the day. You owe me 15 grand, pal. Pay him. Pay that man his money. It's the Bet the Board podcast. God likes me. He really, really likes me. In the end, I wound up right back where I started. I could still pick winners, and I could still make money for all kinds of people back home. And why mess up a good thing? Here's Payne Insider and Todd Furman. Welcome into the Bet the Board podcast, college football week six edition. As the landscape starts to take shape, we have a marquee matchup that is one for the ages for all of you offensive purists out there curious to get the boys' take when we kick things off. I am your host, Todd Furman, joined as always by my esteemed colleagues and co-host on this very fine program, Brad Powers and Payne Insider. How goes it, gentlemen, this fine Wednesday morning? Very well. Looking forward to it. Got some interesting matchups to some teams that we normally don't talk about. Man, I'm already worn down. We've been talking ball for 33 minutes without uh, without <laughs> recording. You know, that's the whole thing. You have to go through warm-ups. You have to work up a little bit of a lather <laughs> before you get into a game situation and be able to hit the ground running. Hey, before we get into uh, the games that we have scheduled, and we want to thank all of our loyal Bet the Board listeners for contributing their thoughts as we put up one of the games to a poll. No shocker here. The SEC wins out over the Big Ten. Uh, Brad, Georgia-Alabama. We see that game go a variety of different directions. Alabama gets out of the gates with four touchdowns early. It looks like Georgia isn't ready to play. They come rallying back, take the lead before they ultimately can't close things out. When you see a game like that, is it a useful data point? Do you adjust your power numbers off it? Or you go, these two teams are exactly what they thought they were because there's very few teams in the country that are able to erase a four touchdown deficit on the road in Tuscaloosa. And maybe it says more about Georgia and some of their resilience than Alabama even getting out to that early lead. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, probably more the latter for me because I just I, I try to keep it simple sometimes when you get a data point that's all over uh, as far as game flow. Uh, and the reality to me is just, you know, ask yourself this. And I, I, I'm not sure. I think it was Payne maybe tweeted this. It's just how many teams can, can, you know, give spot Alabama four touchdowns. You're on the road. You got Carson Beck with four turnovers. And, and yet you're leading with two and a half minutes left. I, I just, I, I kind of felt, if it makes any sense, I felt a little bit better about Georgia's long-term, uh, you know, aspirations that they could take that many punches and they were willing to, you know, obviously games don't mean as much like that yeah. uh, because you can lose a, a game. Like, I mean, obviously 10, 15 years ago, you lose a game like that, you might be done. Uh, but but now you can lose a couple of those games, like if you're Georgia, and, and still make the playoffs. So the fact that they were still able to fight back, take the lead, I I, I got to be honest, uh, in, the, in some of the markets I was pricing some stuff out, Georgia to make the playoffs, Georgia to win it all. So my thought process is Georgia is still the best team in the country. And Georgia will no doubt have their hands full with a couple of tough road trips coming up, so they'll have to earn their way in. Uh, and it's always interesting because, Brad, you live in the same media world to a lesser extent for pain. All the people texting me, oh, if you have to have Alabama, your number one power-rated team in the country after that game. I go, let's pump the brakes a little bit. I would still make Georgia a favorite on a neutral if they ran it back this week. And if anything, I'm not sure Alabama can catch lightning in a bottle for the second straight time. Payne wanted to get your take real quick uh, on that, and then we'll jump into a Friday night affair right here in our lovely Las Vegas backyard. Brad hit it perfectly. I thought there was a lot of obvious from that data point, right? Milrow was clearly the best player on the field. Kalen DeBoer had the better game plan and script. But my tweet that I sent out that that Brad referenced was was spot on and you know you're kind of watching that game you don't see all of the data yet right it hasn't hasn't trickled out yet but that was basically the tweet like only Georgia could spot Alabama 28 and Bryant Denny be minus three in turnovers and still lead with with 231 left in the fourth quarter thought Kirby Smart made some some fine adjustments Carson Beck wasn't even good in this game for large stretches I don't know how you throw a 40-60 ball after you've battled back. But I think the interesting part here is Georgia's offense looks like it got back on track. Hung 500 yards. We thought they would get back on track. That was part of our breakdown last week. Suddenly that Kentucky data point doesn't look so bad, right? Uh, stifled another offense that we, we had high hopes for. 
Brad's the the power ratings guy, but I think if Bama and Georgia lined it up this week on a neutral Georgia, Georgia minus three is the number. And I'll give someone credit. There's a gentleman by the name of, of Brooks Austin who goes by the Film Guy Network, and he provided a fantastic hour-long breakdown of Georgia-Bama, and my feelings are the same as they were minutes after the game. And he was actually a little bit more harsh. He effectively said Alabama played about 12 minutes of, of great football. Um, so something to, to check out if you're a Georgia or even Alabama fan. Should be, uh, no doubt, an SEC race that is hotly contested. As we said, Georgia, plenty of challenges ahead. Road trips to Austin and Oxford to take on the Rebels. Alabama takes on Tennessee, LSU, and a variety of other opponents. So a fascinating race from top to bottom. But to your point, Brad, these teams are allowed a mulligan, maybe two, hailing from the Big Ten and the SEC. One team, guys, that won't be allowed a mulligan from a G5 conference is the UNLV running Rebels. But they'll have a chance to come up with a big-time resume-building win Friday night when they welcome in the Syracuse Orange, it'll be the first time in program history that UNLV will play host to an ACC opponent uh, and the first ever meeting for these programs. Syracuse comes in uh, on the heels of a workmanlike effort against Holy Cross where they got more than 60 players, actual reps. Meanwhile, UNLV absolutely sandblasts Fresno State to the tune of 59-14, making them 4-0 for the first time as a program since 1976. Best start since joining the FBS back in 1978. And that win over Fresno was the largest win for UNLV versus an FBS opponent since 1980 when they beat New Mexico to the tune of 72-7. to The Rebs ranked for the first time in program history. They were just one of 20 teams in the FBS that had never been previous ranked, previously ranked. But a little bit of uncharted territory. This will be the largest number that UNLV lays against a Power 5 opponent going all the way back to 2003 when they took on Kansas. UNLV ultimately lost that game by three touchdowns plus, and they close in that contest as a double-digit favorite. Brad, when we look at Syracuse offensively, we knew this group was going to be improved. Kyle McCord has taken the bull by, by the horns and gone out there and performed. Struggled a little bit in each of the last two weeks with a pair of interceptions. You don't like to see that against Holy Cross. The ground game hasn't been all that dynamic by any stretch of the imagination, and it's a receiving room that it appears a different player is stepping up each and every week, but in steps a UNLV defense that is doing things at a very high level under Barry Odom's tutelage. Most impressively, the way the Rebels take the football away and are able to create short fields for their offense. Yeah, I'm going to give the slight edge to UNLV's defense here, particularly what you mentioned there as far as the turnovers. But 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 let me start with the obvious as far as Syracuse's offense. Yes, they are significantly better than, than a year ago. How could they not be considering the quarterback issues they had? They had a converted tight end playing quarterback uh, at the end of the season. I will not stand uh, here for Dan Villari's slander <laughs> running the option like we saw or Wildcat <laughs> in the bowl game where they lost by 107 points to the Bulls. And took money in that game. I mean, unbelievable. <laughs> Uh, I did not, though, I expected it to be improved. I'm not sure that I had Kyle McCord leading the nation in passing so far. I, I certainly didn't have that. Uh, but, but here he is averaging 365 yards per game. I think you mentioned it, you know, on a down to down basis. You'd like him to be a little bit more consistent. The last two weeks, there's been, he's been sloppy. Four interceptions, including that game changing pick six against Stanford. Uh, that, that was one of the major reasons why they lost that game. Uh, and you mentioned it. UNLV turns people over as well as anybody in the country. 37 forced turnovers uh, dating back to last season, third most in the country in that time period. Uh, I like LeQuinn Allen at running back quite a bit for Syracuse. Uh, the problem is he doesn't have a very good offensive line in front of him. In fact, it's been the weakness. There's no push. They're only averaging about 100 yards per game, uh, which ranks 112th in the country. They've allowed four sacks in each of the last two games, and Boy, Stanford and Holy Cross, you know, to me, that doesn't scream, oh, my God, uh, you know, teams that really attack the quarterback too well. Well, UNLV does get after the quarterback. They're number two in the country in sacks. So don't like the matchup as far as Syracuse up front against UNLV's front. And UNLV's front and their defense in particular, you talk about transfers, the hit or miss. Obviously, they've they've hit on the transfer portal. I mean, when you look at I mean, these are legitimate power four kids 
Jackson Woodard, the, the leading tackler for the last two years, lead, leading the team in sacks, originally in Arkansas with Odom. Obviously was familiar with the system. Uh, he hit the ground running last year, and obviously he's having even a better year this year. Jalen Catalan, another kid that was originally at Arkansas, then went to Texas. I mean, when he was healthy at Arkansas, we're talking about a first-team all-SEC type of player. Obviously, four interceptions. He's a ball hawk. He's their highest-graded player on defense. The Doyle kid just stands out, uh, you know, from a physique aspect uh, at defensive end. He was originally at Texas A&M. So, I mean, Tony Grimes from North Carolina, a highly rated kid that obviously didn't work out well a couple spots, but is playing all right here for UNLV. So, very talented defense uh, with a lot of power forward transfers that obviously are believing in each other. And I would say, you know, for all the talk last week, uh, about Sluka, you know, obviously quitting the team because of NIL. And is Haj Malik, uh, how big of a downgrade is he? Is he even a downgrade? Is he possibly an upgrade because of the passing? I thought the the thing that was missed as far as the narrative was, hey, the reason why UNLV is performing as well as they are this year is because of the defense being so much better than last year. I mean, they were able to win games last year, not necessarily because of the defense. I mean, that, that was, you know, a team that turned people over but gave up yards, gave up points. I mean, they're averaging, you know, giving up 1.5 yards per play less, 100 yards per game less than a year ago, two touchdowns less. It's the defense that's kind of carried this team. Uh, and I, I'm going to give them the slight edge here, even though you mentioned that the wide receiver core for Syracuse is very balanced. Trevor Pena's flashed as a slot receiver. I love Gadsden, the tight end. Hell, last week, the Jackson Meeks kid actually was higher graded per pro football focus. It wasn't Ryan Williams. It wasn't Jeremiah Smith. It was Jackson Meeks who had the highest grade. So uh, there's a lot of options here for Syracuse offense. I got to say, if they're efficient and they you know take care of the football, I think there's a pathway for them to ha- have some success here. But, man, from what I've seen from UNLV's defense the last two years and Syracuse's offensive line, I'm going to give the slight edge to the Rebs here. Gads, then, is the interesting player you bring up there, Brad, because Syracuse didn't shy away from mentioning him by name or at least head coach Fran Brown saying that part of the reason that he hasn't been used that much in the last two games with three catches for 16 yards is because they have such a deep receiving room and he has been invaluable in terms of a run blocker. You do wonder if the squeaky wheel gets the grease and he is a bigger part of the game plan this week against the reps. Payne, I'll come to you in one second to talk UNLV offense, but one last thing, Brad, on UNLV defensively, does the resume for them leave a little bit to be desired when you look at how Houston has now been shut out in back-to-back games? Kansas hasn't looked the same without Andy Kotelnicki as their offensive coordinator and maybe Fresno being the most useful data point that we saw last week even if they're a little bit erratic in their ability to run the ball when they step up in class yeah obviously the Houston data point is not that impressive anymore considering I mean it's the 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 team that uh, is dead last in scoring in in the country I don't know I still like what they did against Kansas Uh, I mean Kansas it's still you know they're inefficient they're turning over but Kansas is moving it the last couple weeks against TCU and, and West Virginia and, you know, I watched Fresno State in the opener move a little bit against Michigan. Yep. So, no, I, I I love this UNLV defense. Again, I, I think the narrative was missed last week um, and why I didn't play back any Fresno State. I, it's the defense that has, you know, kind of carried the way. Well, you mentioned the narrative and the big storyline going into kickoff last week against Fresno was, of course, the NIL situation at quarterback. Haj Malik Williams, the Campbell transfer, takes over pain. Goes 13 of 16, 183 yards passing, 12 rushing attempts, 119 yards, four total touchdowns, becoming the first UNLV quarterback with four total touchdowns and 100 rushing yards in a game since 2022. And more importantly for the Rebels, their best player offensively finally got into the mix. It was you, when you look at Ricky White, 10 catches, 127 yards, a pair of touchdowns, his 11th career 100-yard receiving game. We look at the Rebels' backfield. It's been done by committee. And in steps a Syracuse defense that struggled a little bit against the run, trying to identify who their playmakers are going to be for a group that was heavily praised in terms of what they did in the transfer portal that maybe hasn't quite lived up to those lofty expectations through their first couple games. You mentioned Mark Williams puts on a puts on a show against Fresno. Now it is it's only one data point, and Fresno had little to no tape on Williams. But I give Brad even more credit for for being adamant there was there was no drop off from Sluka to Williams. And now maybe we can you know connect the dots. This was likely known by the biggest boosters and and the coaching staff and. UNLV is a program that probably has to play a little bit of money ball with their funds, potentially pull the shady move and hit the stop payment button because of their belief in Williams. Jerry Tarkany would not have been happy with that kind of move. (laughs) (laughs) So, you know, again, it's a small sample size, but Williams was an efficient runner. And that was maybe the one area where you weren't quite sure. 
if there would be drop off. He was elusive for seven missed tackles, five of Williams, twelve attempts, went ten plus yards. When the play broke down, Williams was able to, you know, turn negatives into positives. Four scrambles for forty eight yards. So if that level of mobility continues, certainly this will be a significant upgrade at quarterback because Williams does give UNLV's passing game some hope, something it just it couldn't do with Sluka. Sluka's adjusted accuracy in the short to intermediate areas was bottom of the barrel. Williams was more accurate in that that window short in both in both intermediate 10 for 11 you mentioned Ricky White he, he can actually be a force now had nine receptions with Sluke in three games caught 10 of 11 targets with Williams for nearly six yards per route run last week you, you look at some of those concepts right it's basically they were just killing Fresno with with the glance route stuff off RPO I <laughs> I think this game gets difficult for me because of the current number. Uh Love all of the early buys on on UNLV at two and a half and three. I think one of our our members here has a couple of those in pocket based upon the tone of the conversation before the show and would understand a Syracuse buy at seven. And and I'm hearing that it's it's potentially coming if it gets to that number where I, I kind of waffle here and why I'm struggling with this game probably more than you boys. There's tape on Williams now. Syracuse has faced RPO zone read offenses in Georgia Tech and Stanford. When you adjust for schedule, you know, Syracuse is outside the top 75 in EPA per rush, but Tech is a a top 25-ish offense. UNLV's run rate over expectation, one of the largest in all of college football. How much does that change with Williams? Probably some. Coming into the season, I was not as high on on Syracuse's defense as the market. I didn't love as many of those defensive transfers that that the Orange brought in. There's been a ton of inconsistency with that unit. I thought Syracuse did a respectable job against Tech's ground game overall, right? If you say, "Hey, we're going to hold you know Haynes and that running back to you know 100 yards," it feels pretty good. Down to down, you look metrically, it's not great against Stanford. The secondary was very fortunate Ashton Daniels missed guys wide open downfield multiple times so I I don't my my mindset on Syracuse's defense is kind of trending towards what I thought about them coming in conference realignment obviously brings even another uh you know added element to some of these weird games that we're getting this season, teams are making unfamiliar trips. Obviously, you know, you get one with Syracuse and Cal. There's just weirdness to some of these trips. And, and Syracuse traveling to Vegas, like on a short week, it's foreign territory. I've just, I've left this game alone. To me, we're kind of in the the middle of the week, which is no man's land. Either you had to get out early on UNLV, or you're kind of just biding your time and being patient, which is kind of seems to be the right approach in the market right now. Uh, certainly has been the last couple of weeks. So if, if you're buying your time, you're probably coming in late and, and thinking Syracuse if you can get a seven. But it's just it's not a game for for me. To me, there's just there's too much variance. I want to see if if this is true for Williams. Uh, not now that there's some tape here. Um, but that's really all I have on this one. No, it's a fast. Are you are you guys going to this game? I have not committed to going just yet. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure if Brad has secured proper parking to guarantee his arrival at Elite Stadium for the game. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Shots Three fired. years, Shots and fired. I'm still getting that. Man, yeah, but Todd holds on to things. He as he should, practice. though, as he should. Uh, uh, Brad, yeah. have you committed to the game? Are you going Friday night? Will you be in attendance as a oh former God, UNLV he's... season ticket holder? I'm not fully committed, but I would say it's more likely I will be there than not. Uh, we're making we're making Brad a dollar thirty favorite to uh, be there in person for the six o'clock local kickoff, which will arguably be one of the biggest games that UNLV have played at home, going all the way back to the Mountain West Championship game where they stubbed their toe against Boise. Win this, UNLV sets up a Friday showdown towards the end of the month with Boise, and potentially mm, the winner of that that's game, a big game gets the inside track to that G five berth. Uh, from the little guy, I figured TB would have you field side there. Todd. Yeah, because that guy's real reliable <laughs> in the grand scheme of things. If there's somebody I can count on in this space, it's that guy. All right. On th- You're going to have him listening to the college no podcast chance he's for listening the first to time co- in 800 No chance. He's, he, he's probably waiting for the NFL version to drop to hear how he shit on his Jets. I forgot Brad has encountered old TV. Uh, there, there's no doubt. Uh, Army Navy, he got to spend quality time with the uh, mercurial man that is TB. <laughs> All right, on to Saturday, boys, where uh, the Ole Miss Rebels will try and bounce back after a disappointing performance against the Kentucky Wildcats last weekend at home in Oxford. 
Ole Miss finds themselves more than a touchdown favorite, nine, nine and a half, pretty much the consensus for their trip to williams Bryce Stadium to take on the Gamecocks, who come into this game fresh off a bye. Total on this game, 53 and a half. Last meeting between these programs came back in 2020. It was Matt Corral and Elijah Moore leading the charge for the Rebels. Juice Wells returning to Columbia after transferring from South Carolina this offseason made some interesting comments that have definitely caught the attention of the South Carolina players, coaching staff, and fans. Should be an electric atmosphere as a result. When we look at Ole Miss, they're looking to avoid an 0-2 start in SEC play for the first time since 2018. Rebels, no doubt, need to clean up their penalty issues. 130th in the country, taking 9.5 penalties a game, 132nd in terms of penalty yardage, the clutching and grabbing in the defensive backfield. Not oftentimes a recipe for success. Meanwhile, South Carolina appears to be healthier than they were in their game heading into the bye against Akron. Lenora Sellers upgraded. Rocket Sanders expected to be out there uh, and not a moment too soon as South Carolina would love to get a big win outright considering they let the LSU game slip through their fingers. And Brad, when we look at this South Carolina offense, they got good quarterback play from their backup in Robbie Ashford, but of course against a team like Akron, not the guy that you want to see starting in this spot. As far as what this offense has brought to the table, they want to run the football, but they're starting to see some playmakers emerge on the outside. And for all the shortcomings that Ole Miss showed, at least from an offensive line and offensive capabilities last week against Kentucky, their defense has held down the fort pretty well. And I think that was the unit that probably didn't get enough buzz coming into the year, why Ole Miss was a legitimate contender to make the college football, because they had beefed up along the defensive line and the stop unit was going to be significantly better than what we've seen in recent installations. Yeah, on paper, this is a pretty big edge for the Ole Miss defense here, particularly that South Carolina offensive line against that Ole Miss defensive front. But uh, first, uh, boy, the South Carolina offense <laughs> leaves a little bit to be desired. I mean, I, I know Payne's a big fan of that offensive coordinator, uh, Dowell Loggins. <laughs> I mean, he's just just a, a world beater at the NFL. And <laughs> continuing it here at South Carolina where, you know, an offense averages – you know, 5.5 yards per play, number 93rd in the country, uh, yards per game, struggling. Uh, points per game, I mean, their defense setting them up for some short fields, particularly in that Kentucky game uh, where they somehow scored 31 points. Uh, in that one, that, that's more of a head scratcher. That seems more like the outlier for Kentucky uh, than, than vice versa. Uh, boy, look, look, you heard some good things in fall camp about two units, one being the South Carolina defense, the other being Lenora Sellers. One turned out to be Absolutely correct, that being the defense. One, not so much on Sellers. Uh, number 95 in the country in QBR. Uh, boy, he doesn't do much. <laughs> I know he can run a little bit, but uh, 55%, 2 2 ratio, taking 10 sacks, and he's only played two and a half games. Uh, I'm not overly impressed with Sellers from what I've seen. In fact, I mean, it's short sample size, and I know it was Akron in the second half of the LSU game, but I mean, Ashford was more efficient. Uh, yards per yards per attempt uh, if you believe in the PFF grades highest graded offensive player but uh, Sanders being healthy is certainly going to help him a guy you know that underrated probably transfer pickup for them coming over from Arkansas uh, been banged up but again like you mentioned expected to go uh, along with sellers here they don't have the I, I'm glad that you mentioned this they don't really have a go-to wide receiver but they got four or five guys that if you can get them the football, they've been explosive. Uh, I like the kid from Iowa, Ohio, the, the the Simon kid at tight end, a transfer from Western Kentucky. Uh, if you can get the, the ball to these guys in space, they can make plays. question is, I don't know if they have a quarterback that can do that. The offensive line, though, has been an issue. 16 sacks allowed in four games, bottom three in the country, a number 97 pass blocking grade. Uh, I, they're up against it here. And what they're up against is an Ole Miss defensive front that I know the competition has been questionable, but it's not like this is a great South Carolina offense. But the Ole Miss defense, number one in adjusted line yards per rush, number two in success rate, number two in sacks, number one in TFLs, 53 TFLs already this season. They have 11 players already credited with the sack already. So it comes from a variety of uh, different waves. Chris Paul kind of le- leads the way at linebacker. Nolan, uh, the, the transfer from Texas A&M, plugs up the middle and opens it up for the defensive ends. Uman Milan, uh, Perkins, a uh, five-star kid at, at linebacker that, that's starting to flash for them. Ivy's been there forever. Uh, he's been their highest graded player uh, they don't allow anything you know South Carolina I know they want to run the football and I know they want to play you know clock control like Kentucky did but can they I, I mean Ole Miss's defense is only giving up 46 rush yards per game they're, they're number one in the country in yards per carry 
Now, Kentucky was able to control it for 40 minutes, but I'm wondering how sustainable it is. They were three for three on fourth down, including that Hail Mary. Uh, the, the play that gets overlooked is, I mean, Kentucky had basically a Hail Mary pass on fourth down on their on their last scoring drive. They don't get that. Ole Miss, you know, wins, holds on. Uh, obviously, it's a non-cover, but I just question, what's this line if Ole Miss hangs on uh, to, to that and they don't get that pass? Uh, I just uh, provided, and I'm anxious to see – what Payne's thoughts are on the other side of the ball, but provided Ole Miss, his heads are on straight, which I got a question, a lot of rumors swirling about Kiffin. I I don't see a pathway here for South Carolina's offense to have much success. It is an interesting matchup because I think all the eyeballs will be on the other side of the ball, Payne, that you're about to discuss and break down for us. When we look at an Ole Miss offense, matched up against a South Carolina defense that has been as disruptive as any in the country when it comes to creating havoc and providing speed off of the edge. As far as the Ole Miss offense is concerned, look, they went out there and they beat up on the Sisters of the Poor. They put up crooked numbers on defenses all ranked outside the top 130 in Middle Tennessee State, Wake Forest, and Georgia Southern to try and build some of that goodwill. I mean, this is a group that has shown their struggles away from Oxford under Lane Kiffin. The offense hasn't been nearly as dynamic on the road as what they are at home. Uh, And when we look at what they did last week, 129 total yards in the first half was the fewest by a Lane Kiffin team uh, since it was at FAU or Ole Miss uh, against Kentucky. And while Ole Miss fans were extremely excited about Jackson Dart, they thought he was the dude to lead the offense. When the ground game doesn't get going for the Rebels, the passing game can't operate as the standalone entity, even when you have playmakers like a Trey Harris and a Juice Wells, who I'm sure will factor prominently in the offense. But when we look at South Carolina, do they have enough defensively to be able to disrupt the offensive line of Ole Miss that has a lot of questions to answer, given that some of the starters and depth pieces are extremely banged up going into this week's game? As Brad was talking about this, I think we were kind of in lockstep that it was unfortunate Ole Miss stubbed their toe last week because maybe we had South Carolina circled in this spot, but completely envisioned getting more. I I can't do it now. Ole Miss, to your point, saw their first living, breathing defense in in Kentucky, and obviously Kentucky's defense is damn good. It looks even better now when you go into Ole Miss and stifle that offense, and you did it back-to-back weeks with obviously uh, hampering Georgia's ability to, to move the ball and score points as well. I think we've mentioned, you know, this in passing multiple times about that Kentucky front seven, but Ole Miss just looked shell-shocked, right? Kentucky was a massive step up in class for the Rebels after starting the season against the teams you mentioned, MTSU, Wake Forest, Georgia Southern. You conveniently forgot Furman, but I, I know why, because every <laughs> Look, time I watch your a videos, there's a purple hat anymore. in the, the background. The Paladins don't have a Lawrence Taylor on their <laughs> roster to compete against elite FBS offenses. I just it just dawned on me seeing that purple hat in a lot of your uh, your video backgrounds. I gotta bust, I gotta bust so. that out again. I've uh, I've put that on retirement <laughs> for a little while, but now that you mentioned, I may have to bring it out. We had those four defenses uh, with an average schedule adjust efficiency rank of of a hundred and twenty ninth. So, and the question we had coming in to the season, I think even Old Miss fans would agree, is like, what was the offensive line? What would that be? And you know, I think if you look last week at the Kentucky game without the right context, it probably appears as if the Rebels O-line played decently. However, like Kentucky only sent more than four rushers at Ole Miss on 16% of Jackson Dart's dropback, still created a 39% pressure rate. You look at the O-line yards, appears to be a decent performance for the Rebels O-line. Kentucky rushed three and dropped eight a ton. And still, uh, on the 13 Henry Parrish runs, he averaged one and a half yards before first contact. It wasn't this dominating effort. We still have no idea where where Bentley is. So uh, now you get a a rested South Carolina front, 15% havoc rate created. Kennard, Stewart, Standers, 16% pressure rate on pass rush snaps combined. Ole Miss just needs to be better all around. Lane Kiffin's game plan was kind of... Man, last week, right? Jackson Dart continues to struggle with a few aspects of his game. It's just amazing when we kind of fast track to to 2024 where he was at in some of the Heisman markets. And I know a lot of us just kind of shied away from that at some point last year. There was talks of of him being benched. Um, if you look at Dart, like the head goes down far too quickly. He just kind of looks to escape the pocket rather than navigating it with his eyes downfield and going through progressions. It's really uh, 
a hindrance to his game. He just he hasn't quite developed there. Now, I think the other thing that you have to think about is Old Miss willing to be patient. It's not just who you play the first four weeks, but like how you play them. And they almost went through it like like playing Madden on rookie level, just pushing the ball downfield and living off explosives. And suddenly when they were tasked with like going methodical last week, they just weren't willing to be patient. I think some of that was the the number of snaps. There just wasn't a lot of them because Kentucky's offense was able to methodically move it and extend drives on third down and to, to Brad's point on fourth down and kind of kept Ole Miss off the field to where maybe they panicked a little bit, not getting enough snaps where they say, hey, we just need to continue to be aggressive. I think Dart's going to see some zone this week, obviously. So he's got to be willing to take what he's given. Does another receiver other than Trey Harris step up? 15 targets last week for him. No other receiver eclipsed two. Who's the other guy? It's supposed to be Juice Wells. Caden Prescore has to take on a bigger role too. Yeah, I mean, but you hinted at, at the top there, Todd. You'd think this is a great spot for Juice Wells against his former team. A defense Wells knows extremely well, having ran routes against it every day at practice for two years. He should know the weak spots of the zone, should know where to sit down in some of these openings. The one thing Beamer talked about um, this week was tackling better. South Carolina is great at 119th and tackling have to be better this week, which is difficult sometimes, you know, off a bye when you haven't seen live bullets for nearly two weeks. Again, like had Old Miss not peed down its leg last week, we would have been looking at a bye point close to to 13. We're well below 10 now. So my my interest just just isn't there. And I think to to Brad's points, difficult to gauge Old Miss because the the peaks are high, right? And if you get the peak Old Miss performance, it's probably difficult to envision South Carolina keeping up. But there's a lot of iffy performances, and we're not in love with Jackson Dart, and the rumors are swirling. So it just I've kind of another game where I've kind of kept on the sidelines here very curious gentlemen to see where this next move goes we know the market is pretty much painted in no man's land at nine and a half we'll see if it did get to 10 if there was a little bit of an appetite for the underdog uh in this particular spot so something to keep in mind uh, as we watch the market and we know how fluid some of these things are but definitely a prove it type game for old miss to bounce back before they have a big time showdown against lsu the following week We'll stick in the SEC for an early kickoff, and I think it's a fascinating matchup at Kyle Field, 11 o'clock Central, where Texas A&M plays host to Missouri. We're looking at A&M, pretty much a two-point favorite across the board. There are some one-and-a-halves. There are some two-and-a-halves out there. Total on the game sitting primarily at 48-and-a-half. When we look at these two teams, Missouri comes into this spot well-rested. Eight-game win streak tied for the longest active streak in the FBS with Army. Three straight wins against ranked teams. It's the longest for the program since 1976. When we look at A&M on the other side, they enter the contest fresh off a 21-17 win over Arkansas, but they were outgained in that game by 82 yards, were able to force three turnovers, and for the fourth straight game, come away with, you know, give up a takeaway. When we look at AM, they've won close games this year, 2-0 and in one-score games. They had lost eight straight of that variety entering the season. Three games this season with zero giveaways and multiple takeaways, tied for the most in the country with Maryland. Interesting side story here. Eli Drinkowitz joked all week about how Missouri's football's assistant director of on-campus recruiting wasn't going to be able to attend practices because she just happens to be the sister of potential Texas A&M starting quarterback Marcel Reed. Brad, when we mention Marcel Reed in this AM offense, we're still not sure that he is definitely going to be the starting quarterback this week. Connor Wegman rehabbing from that shoulder injury, and this is a guy in Reed who entered last season fourth in the depth chart, got his first real reps in the bowl game, showed his athleticism, and we've seen some of that on full display, both as a runner and a passer, but they need to try and get other playmakers involved against the Missouri defense that'll now have two weeks to scheme things up. They faced mobile quarterbacks in recent weeks and Thomas Castellanos for Boston College, Diego Pavia in their SEC opener leading into the bye for Vanderbilt. But this is also a Missouri defense that I think all of us had questions about coming into the year in terms of how they would look and what kind of drop off there could potentially be once their defensive coordinator decided to head off to Baton Rouge and leave them with a little bit of a different change of the guard uh, on that side of the ball. Yeah, very interesting matchup, and I think it's going to be an interesting battle in the marketplace here. I, as of right now, more questions than answers as far as I'm concerned, starting with Missouri, who I got to give the, the, the edge to. I, obviously, any metric you look at uh, says that they have a sl- you know at least a slight edge here. But then again, 
questionable competition. Uh, this is their first road trip uh, of the season. As the, you know, the competition increased a little bit. Uh, obviously, you know, after allowing 98 yards total in, in the opener, uh, we, we saw Vanderbilt. And, and I got to tip my cap to you guys as far as market movement and, and it just being on the right side. I mean, that was obviously one, one of the best sides of the season so far, Vanderbilt against this Missouri defense. Uh, I'll switch over to the A&M offense, though. You mentioned Marcel Reed. Uh, had success against Florida that first game. Obviously, Florida's defense leaves a lot to be desired, but the there was some optimism there, and you know, even a guy like myself was thinking, "Hey, maybe this is this is their guy uh, instead of Wegman." Because we- Wegman, uh, obviously, in, in the two starts that he had, fifty-two percent, two-two ratio, only five yards per attempt. I know it was Notre Dame's pass defense in one of those games, but my goodness, uh, more of the same for him. He did, did not look improved in my opinion, came in fat and overweight. Uh, so th- there wasn't a lot to like about Wegman. But as Payne mentioned in the last, in, in the, one of the previous handicaps as far as Hajj Malik Williams for UNLV, as we've gotten tape on Marcel Reed, boy, you, you look at the offensive numbers, and boy, over the three starts, the success rates, the points per play, all of the different metrics have gone down after the Florida game, and it's not like that they played that much better defenses in Bowling Green and Arkansas. So there has to be a little bit of concern there. Uh, for for this A and M offense, if Reed's gotten figured out, one guy that has played well is, is Le'Veon Moss. Has emerged as that bell cow. We thought coming into the season they'd have a three headed monster. Obviously, uh, they had an injury there, uh, but but Moss has you know been more than than what they could ask for at that position. There's been inconsistency at wide receiver, mainly due to inconsistent quarterback play. I mean, you thought Cyrus Allen might be their go to guy this season, and then he has just one two one catch in the last two weeks. Noah Thomas is a big kid. Uh, emerged last week with 109 yards. I, I, I kind of watching their spring. I thought that 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 he would be their their go to guy this year. And some concerns on the offensive line, particularly injuries. Starting center Naboo out for the season with injury in the opener. His replacement T.J. Shanahan missed last week's game due to suspension. Reed Adams, at right guard, got hurt in last week's game. So again, more questions than answers for the, the this offensive line. Uh, their right tackles played well, but but man. Uh, you know, the, the two of their better defenses they face, Notre Dame and Arkansas, this offense, you know, didn't even top 300 yards. And I'd put this Missouri defense, at least, to, you know, in that category, probably Notre Dame a little bit better. Uh, can they sustain drives here? Because, I, I mean, A&M's offense, number 87 and third and fourth down success. Missouri's defense has done well in those categories, number six. And even though the questionable competition, I mean, you got to look at Missouri's defense, number four in defensive success rate. Uh, I like their front seven. Uh, I think that we've gotten some more answers uh, they, they, there, especially a defensive tackle. There's just not many, very many teams in the country that can have a guy, you know, Chris McClellan from Florida at 6'1", 320, and the Christian Williams kid from Oregon at 6'2", 340. Now, a lot of teams would love to have that, a defensive tackle, as far as size. And, and they've been impressive, uh, not only in the run game, but also getting their hands up in the pass game. With that being said, I've seen some broken coverages. Long pass against BC, long pass against Vanderbilt. Vanderbilt missed three field goals. I know you guys are well aware of that one, but uh, I, I, I need to I need to see this Missouri defense against a, uh, a at least a competent offense, and I'm not sure A and M's that. So the, it might be another week or two before we figure out this Missouri defense and how good they can be. No, it's a, it's a great question. When you look at the questionable competition, Missouri's schedule will no doubt get a little bit stiffer, and I think their bye came at the perfect time for them to shore up some of the things on the back end uh, against an A&M team who no doubt wants to try and have their resume-defining win in the wake of a close victory last week where the game happened to fall right in the middle as we saw the dog take money at the top at plus six at Arkansas we saw A&M get laid at minus three so the market appears to have a decent read on that team at least for now Payne Missouri offensively look you've been higher on their starting quarterback than almost anybody and this is a Tigers offense that comes in ranked 19th in the country in total offense 29th in scoring offense Brady Cook's numbers don't wow you to start the season 68% completions four touchdown passes one pick four rushing touchdowns to go along Along with that, we've seen them figure out their backfield rotation. It looks like Nate Noel has emerged as their RB1, Marcus Carroll, uh, also providing a nice change of pace. Two G5 guys that we thought could step up, maybe not provide the same impact of Cody Schrader, uh, but still give them some of those very capable 
down in distance. When we look at the receiving room, we know Luther Burden is the alpha, but Theo Weiss has actually been more prolific in terms of yardage so far. You do wonder what Missouri has kept at bay, given how soft their schedule was to start the season and how much different and more dynamic they could look here. Meanwhile, on the other side for a and I mean, they've held four straight opponents, 20 points or fewer. Five is the longest active streak in the FBS by five different teams. We knew this defense was going to get better with Mike Elko's fingerprints all over it and the difference maker being Nick Scorton. His ability to wreak havoc on games has no doubt been lost on what Kirby Moore and this Missouri offense wants to do coming out of the bye, headed into hostile territory. Wide range of opinions from guys I respect about this matchup based upon a few things. Missouri's schedule, which you you mentioned there, haven't really played a defense with a pulse aside from Boston College, and against that lone top 40 BC defense, Missouri couldn't really generate anything on the ground 29 percent rushing success rate couldn't you know generate any explosiveness through the air AM's defense we did have you know some questions about their secondary coming into the season and on the surface you see hey you know competition probably a little bit better two top 25 offenses faced in Notre Dame and Florida and maybe you think they're battle tested but we talked about Notre Dame last week uh, one of the worst passing offenses in the P4, zero explosiveness to speak of, Florida's passing offense. I think it's solid. You go to the A&M game, it was an absolute monsoon with wind, and the Gators' top receiver, Eugene Wilson, didn't play. And so, you know, I, I do have some questions there. a and M secondary, obviously, you know, gets helped by that defensive line up front, which you mentioned, uh, but they're still outside our top 70 and schedule-adjusted EPA per pass allowed. So, I think that's potentially where, you know, Missouri finds some of its success. You are now the third person to either tell me or hint that Missouri's offensive coordinator, Kirby Moore, has held back a lot of his offense and that it's something he's done for multiple years until games start to matter. He did it at Fresno. We'll see. I'm I'm putting a little bit of stock into that theory because you mentioned Luther Burden only has 19 receptions. He's not even the top targeted weapon. Uh, Missouri has three deep completions all season. And for an offense that returns nine starters, it just doesn't look like it finished last season. So this would probably be a pretty good spot for, for Kirby Moore <laughs> to un, unleash the full offense, especially off the bye. On the ground, if you look at concept Missouri's main one is outside zone A&M loves to get up the field and shoot gaps they stuff 27 percent of runs create a ton of havoc and kind of push the line of scrimmage back so I would expect some negatives for Missouri's ground game but it also could lead to some some trunk runs for Nate Noel 18 percent of his carries have gone for 10 plus yards good one cut runner likes to cut back A&M has, has certainly given up their fair share of explosive runs because they are so aggressive. Saw that in the Notre Dame game. Brady Cook has a significant delta larger than the, the national average when pressured versus kept clean. So even in his best seasons of his career, which was you know last year, 5% turnover-worthy play rate, it's approaching 7% this season. That could certainly be a little bit of an X, X factor here if A&M's front is, is creating some pressure. The other two things causing differing opinions is this being Missouri's first road game of the season, right? Hell of an environment uh, for your your road debut. And then Brad mentioned it, the question mark at quarterback for A&M. Betters I speak with believe Marcel Reed is is the better option for the Aggies. Fits Colin Klein's system better. But Connor Wegman seems to be trending healthy enough to play. Nobody wants A and M if it's Wegman, is my understanding. So there's there's a lot of moving parts to this game. Uh, another one that I'm kind of on the sidelines here for, but would be interested to see if this gets to three. Uh, what the market does potentially if Wegman is is upgraded, I think there would be some some yeah. potential interest in in Missouri at three if it's Wegman. I'm very curious to see what the total does, too, if Wegman ends up being announced as a starter. If that was a total, would leak up or it would come down. Uh, I'm very curious in terms of how the market would tip its hand in that particular market. 
uh, compared to the side. But no doubt one of the bigger storylines to follow and should be one of the fun games to monitor uh, with that early noon Eastern kickoff from Unelectric Atmosphere and Kyle Field. Uh, you can follow our talented team on social media. Get Brad Powers available at Brad Powers 7. You can follow Payne there as well at Payne Insider. And most importantly, as always, for all things Bet the Board related, be sure to follow the podcast at Bet the Board Pod. And if you haven't already signed up and subscribed to the Bet the Board Podcast newsletter, I'm going to remind you until I am blue in the face. It is a great reminder for all the things you may have missed during the course of the week. And while NFL best bets haven't been delivered at the high standard we hold ourselves accountable to around these parts, it hasn't stopped that newsletter from going a perfect 4-0. So another great way to add a bet to your portfolio each and every week throughout the course of the NFL season. And I feel like a broken record, gentlemen, because we've done two SEC games and we put this up to a fan vote. We gave them an opportunity to pick a matchup that they felt was the most intriguing, and they decided that we would stick in the ACC for Tennessee fresh off a bye, headed to Fayetteville to take on the Arkansas Razorbacks. And when we look at the number in the market for this one, Tennessee a 13.5 point favorite, and that's pretty much painted at every notable sports book throughout the landscape. The total, a little bit of a different story, as low as 59 at some shops, as high as 60.5 out there. Uh, and when we look at these two teams, They last played in 2020. Arkansas has won three straight in the series. Vols haven't actually won in Fayetteville since all the way back at turn of century in 2001. When we look at Tennessee, they remain one of four teams in the country not to trail for a single second so far this season, joining Texas, Indiana, and Army. And we can go one step further when we look at their talented pivot and Nico under center. He has yet to trail for a single snap as a starting quarterback while with Tennessee going back to their bowl game against Iowa. Mm. When we look at Tennessee, they snapped a 28-game road losing streak for his AP Top 15 opponents with a win at Oklahoma. Led that game 22-3 to entering the fourth quarter. Ultimately allowed two offensive touchdowns, snapping a streak of 19 quarters without allowing a touchdown. Meanwhile, for Arkansas, this will be the first conference home game and only their second true home game of the season for the Hogs. They haven't beaten an AP Top 5 team at home since 1999 when they beat Tennessee. Have not beaten an AP Top 5 team anywhere since 2007 when they knocked off LSU. But when we look at what the uh, excuse me, what the Hogs have done so far this season, they have actually outgained the two ranked opponents on their schedule. Losing at Oklahoma State in overtime despite a 648 to 385 yardage edge, finished that game minus two in turnovers against AM last week, 379 to 297, but finished minus three in turnovers. There is a high level of familiarity as Arkansas has two Tennessee transfers playing very prominent roles, one on the offensive and one on the defensive side of the ball. But Brad, when we look at Tennessee, no surprise to anyone, the key to their season has been getting out to quick starts, outscoring their opponents 78-3 to in the first quarter. They lead the FBS in points per game, points per game differential. Mention Nico, but you dig into some of those numbers. NC State and Oklahoma didn't light the world on fire. This team wants to run the football, and when they can get the ground game going, it opens everything else up. Here comes an Arkansas defense, not elite stopping the run, but not a slouch in that department either along the defensive line. Yeah, obvious edge to Tennessee's offense here. Although I'm going to dig in further to to a couple points you made and also grade Tennessee on a little bit of a tougher curve uh, as far as looking at future matchups down and down the line. Because I'm obviously Tennessee's relative to that preseason expectations. A lot of their dynamics of the season have changed. I mean, they went from oh they could, they could make the playoffs to now nah, we're making the playoffs and we believe we're a national title contender. Boy, I Nico's. Like, as you mentioned, great as a front runner, but in, in those two more high leverage games that they played, I mean, there's a reason why he's only number 26 in QBR, a couple of fumbles against Oklahoma, bailed out by the Oklahoma uh, offense, turning it over right back. Uh, you mentioned the run game. I, I think that's been a big part of the reason that has made this offense. You think Tennessee, you think, you know, big explosive plays, you think normally pass game. It's actually been the run game this year that's led the way, which is, you know, a little bit of a question mark. We knew Dylan Sampson was a known commodity, but could he be the bell cow? Because it was a three-headed monster last year. He's been number 10 in the country and weighted EPA per rush. Deshaun Bishop, the freshman, has been a big surprise, number 19th in the country and weighted EPA per rush. I mean, there's a number, a reason those two guys, why Tennessee's offense is number two in, in EPA rush. Uh, Dante Thornton's been great at wide receiver, big play threat. We saw it in the Oklahoma game, 34.5 yards per catch on the season. McCoy Brazil White uh, obviously improved wide receiver compor- uh, core compared to last year. 
The offensive line has been banged up. That's been a concern. Starting left tackle, Hurd has missed the last couple of games with injury. The right tackle, John Campbell, left the Oklahoma game early. Heupel, if you're reading his press clippings this week, does expect both uh, th- th- this week uh, against Arkansas in this game, so that'll be big. I I do want to bring up the – not that o- Arkansas's defense is Oklahoma's defense. Obviously, OU's is better, but – I do find it interesting. You take out the 66-yard explosive to Thornton in the first quarter of that Tennessee-Oklahoma game. In Tennessee's other 72 plays, they averaged 3.9 yards per play. Uh, stack rank that across the country, that'd be number 132. That I mean, I'm not saying it's a worry for this game, but and I know they went a little bit conservative because they were up in Oklahoma's offense where it was compromised, but when they play better defenses down the road and they'll see in the, you know, the, down the road in the regular season, possibly the, the playoffs, I I haven't seen it yet fully on this Tennessee offense, even though they're the highest scoring offense in the country. On on the other side of uh, of the ball with Arkansas's defense, obviously this is the best offense they've faced so far. Uh, you know the, the numbers are average, uh, you know slightly above average yards per play, fifty fifth yards per game, forty seven points per game, forty fourth. You mentioned the rush defense has been the strength, number twenty first in the country in rush defense. Although the more advanced metrics, EPA per rush, are only fifty eighth. Uh, the, the drop back hasn't been good. There's been some breakdowns on the back end, particularly because the secondary has been banged up. Yep. Hudson Clark, Hudson Clark uh, did not play last week. Jalen Braxton's been out for three games with tendonitis. I mean, th- th- those guys are projected starters. If you looked at preseason camp, uh, cornerback Stewart came out last week. Uh, you know, if you listen to Pittman th- th- this week, he doesn't think Braxton's going to play. He does think Hudson Clark's going to be back. Uh, if they really needed him last week, he thought he could. Well, I mean, you like to win a game. You know, your job's on the line, Sam Pittman. I, I, I'd like to go optimal. Uh, I, I don't know what these guys are doing. I mean, you, you go back to the last game. I mean, I, I don't know what uh, the, the, the holding back the, the Missouri offensive line. You know, the, the Missouri offense. You could have lost the Boston College and Vanderbilt games. I at some point you got to you know be optimal and, and win football games. But uh, I, the, the worry for me, obviously, Landon Jackson's their known commodity at defensive end. It's like I'm I'm big on watching film and you know guy makes a couple plays I highlight or circle okay he can play uh, you know the, the, this is a player maybe not a known commodity in the season that I didn't know about I've watched four of Arkansas's games I don't have a single player on defense outside of Landon Jackson circled or highlighted to me that's not a good sign here when you're going up against Tennessee's offense so obviously edge here to Tennessee's offense although keep an eye on, on some maybe future struggles when, when the competition on defense gets a little tougher down the road. Yeah, I'm not going to put Tennessee's offense uh, on notice the same way as Ole Miss offensively because I do think Nico can trend up and he's going to be most likely a first-round pick in the NFL, unlike Jackson Dart. Uh, but you do wonder if he has been forced to throw in some of these games they can't get the ground game going. Doesn't look nearly as dynamic despite wins on the road against Oklahoma and on a neutral against NC State earlier this year. Payne, on the other side of the ball, Tennessee's defense has been all the rage, and people talk about how it's one of the most underrated units in the country, including Nick Saban doing the same thing, saying that Tennessee's defense is probably one of the most underrated units in in all of college football. I mean, this group has three takeaways in each of its last three road and neutral site games, allowing its fewest points per game through four games since 1966. Uh, I mean, the numbers are staggering, but then you dig into the schedule that they've played of opposing offenses, especially at the FBS level. It's Oklahoma, who's 109th in total offense, average at 114th in yards per play. Kent State, 134th in total offense, 132nd in yards per play. And NC State, 119th in total offense, 108th in yards per play. In that regard, this, you can make the case, will be the most dynamic offense that Tennessee has played in the form of Arkansas problem for the Razorbacks everything you read leading up to this game they're talking about how Taylor Green is struggling with his confidence because they can't get their protection schemes correct and they're dealing with some injuries at the tight end position as well I think you said everything right there I don't know in terms of Tennessee's defense being underrated I mean it's a top 10 defense by our metrics so uh, it would feel properly rated I think when you look at Arkansas's offense, a bit of a, a roller coaster, maybe a, a better team than anticipated, but still has the potential to win just five games. But I think if you you maybe catch the Hogs at peak, eh, give Tennessee a little bit of a little bit of problems. I think the market is is indicating that uh, 
this is this is potentially a runaway here. I think what makes this tricky is is the data points that we thought were massive positives for Arkansas have, have aged like milk uh, and become less impressive by the week. Hanging tough with with Oklahoma State suddenly isn't what we thought it was. Beating Auburn with their low three star redshirt freshman quarterback Hank Brown starting, you know, kind of meh. So. I just, you know, those those aren't great data points to me uh, like they would have been two or three weeks ago had we talked about this game. Talon Green is is the large reason for the roller coaster. Inaccurate, puts the ball in harm's way. You mentioned some of those confidence issues with the protections up front, but he is wildly athletic. He's mobile. He kind of wants to make the, the three-point basketball play, so to speak, right, which, which makes Arkansas's passing offense have extreme variance. If you look at Green's dot, it's 11 yards. Uh, nearly 44% of his passes get thrown 10-plus yards. That's the one area of Tennessee's defense that has not been tested yet, right? They're, they're secondary, something we mentioned coming into the season. We thought some of these opponents may test that, but NC State, as you look now with more data points, outside the top 100 in EPA per pass. Oklahoma can't throw the forward pass. It's why Jackson Arnold has been benched. The Sooners wide receiver group has been decimated by injury with its top five guys all missing time. So you start to wonder there. Um, if Arkansas is able to keep this close, it's because, you know, Tennessee does a poor job keeping its rush integrity and Taylor Green is able to to get outside the pocket. And then Taylor Green's able to hit a few deep shots with, with Andrew Armstrong winning on the outside. It's really the only path. I don't see that happening consistently, you know, with, with Tennessee having two weeks to prepare. The Vols' defensive line is certainly rested from not just the bye, but they rotate 10, 12 guys up front. And for two weeks now, Tim Banks has been hammering the point home about, you know, keeping your rush lanes, keeping that integrity. And I think Tennessee's defense has improved, at least the eye test, in terms of team speed, uh, especially with Arian Carter in the middle there. If Tennessee makes Talon Green hold the ball in the pocket, Arkansas's O-line group is far from elite. That combination of of holding on to the ball for like 3.3 seconds on average and then that O-line group, it's it's really allowed opposing defensive lines to create a ton of havoc and tackles for losses. Uh, Arkansas outside the top 100 and defensive line havoc allowed. And so if you can get Arkansas in those long down situations, the Vols can drop their coverage, negate the explosive by that scheme, force Green to read and go through progressions and be an accurate passer in that 5 to 15-yard window. I just don't think Green can do that consistently. He leads all SEC quarterbacks with 65 inaccurate passes. Over 40% of Green's pass attempts through five games have been deemed inaccurate. So I think this is a a tough matchup for Arkansas's offense. But, again, if, if Tennessee's too aggressive here, there is that potential for, for Green to get outside the pocket, use his mobility, and potentially hit a couple explosives down the field, which is really – the only path Arkansas has for offensive success here. We think this number gets to 14 or 13 and a half feel like the perfect price tag to create two way action in the market gents. It's a good question. Brad, what do you think here? Mm. The way you just broke it it's down. It's tough. T- tells me that we're going to see some 14. Yeah. It's kind of, uh, there will be buyback at 14 and a half. Yeah. I will tell you that there yeah, already yeah. has been. <laughs> if you catch my drift. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hey, these are these are the kind of interesting chess matches that are out there. Arkansas going to try and lean into that home crowd. Hopefully, they can put Tennessee secondary that hasn't really been tested in a bit of conflict. Meanwhile, for the Vols, I mean, this is a team that everyone has talked about as a legitimate threat to win the SEC if things break the right way, and especially if their young quarterback continues to develop and makes this passing attack that much more dynamic than what we've seen through the early going this season all right gentlemen that was maybe the path right like a young Tennessee quarterback struggling on the road in the environment but they just kind of had that right in 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 Norman a little bit and then you kind of get a bye week to kind of regroup and put that all together and so maybe this isn't the environment that we thought would would potentially rattle a a young quarterback because he's he's just gone through the question that I have and I'm very curious to see this week compared to what it was at Oklahoma you could tell that Tennessee had absolutely no fear of Oklahoma getting back into that football game that once they were able to build a multi-score lead they pretty much just shut it down and Oklahoma just sat yeah Oklahoma fought back and you know look if there's a bounce here bounce there would have had a chance to sneak in the back door I think there may be a little bit more respect from Tennessee defensively for what Arkansas's offense can do so you wonder if they keep their foot on the accelerator and try and build themselves a comfortable margin. So we'll see exactly what transpires in Fayetteville. Uh, out of the SEC, boys, it's time to give the little guys their love. Uh, and Brad, 
Last week, you gave all of our listeners an absolute rocking chair winner at Rentschler Field with UConn blasting Buffalo. That game was over, even with UConn losing their starting quarterback by the time we got to halftime. When you look at that non-Powers 5 potential landscape this week, what have you identified as a potential landing spot where we can replicate that effort of a week ago? Yeah, we're not going to go too far from last week. We're going right back to the, the, this wagon we call the, the Connecticut Huskies. No, not basketball. We're talking the football team uh, with four straight covers now by 29 points per game for this UConn team. Not sure the market or even my power rings can catch up to this team. It's not nothing been fluky. Uh, dead even in turnover margin in those four games. So it's not like they were plus four or five in, in a couple of the games. Obviously destroyed Florida Atlantic, Buffalo the last two weeks. Two teams, in my opinion, much better than Temple. At home, they're outscoring opponents by six touchdowns per game, uh, You know, 300-plus yards per game margin. And, and I mentioned home because – Looking at Connecticut's schedule, they do not have a road game until November. They have six straight home games. Uh, boy, I start looking, you know, is this starting to get pricey? Am I paying a premium on, on Connecticut yet? i, I got to be honest. I mean, I look at power rings with no priors that, that are out there in the market. They have this Connecticut team priced nationally in like, like the 50s, meaning, you know, your stack ranking 1 through 134, they're ranked in the 50th, in the 50s. I mean, that – that screams a little bit of value here against a Temple team that's bottom 10 in the country. Uh, you mentioned the quarterback being banged up, Evers. Uh, no worries. Uh, the, the, the better passer is the projected starter coming in the season, uh, Fagnano, 10 touchdowns, one pick. So actually, you know, some, somewhat opens the, uh, the offense up a little bit more when he's in there. He's not as good of a runner as Evers is or, or as talented, but obviously better passer. Uh, I won't get too much into the Temple quarterback side, but uh, keep uh, in mind on the injury front there. Could not be a good situation for them uh, as far as Temple quarterback injury. And because of that, I don't expect to see Temple money too much this week. So we're going to ride it again one more week. Connecticut, not a big chalk eater as far as big favorites on, on this show. So I apologize for the guys, but uh, we're laying 16 and a half. Hey, there's no apologies. The winners, if you're laying points or taking points, pay just the same. Uh, and you've identified UConn as a team flying under the radar. I mean, you look at their results over the last couple of weeks and stubbing their toe in their opener against Maryland. Blasted Merrimack, exceeded oddsmakers' expectations there. Nearly had a chance to upset an undefeated Duke side uh, on the road in Durham. And then you look at what they've done each of the last two weeks at home. Held FAU and Buffalo to combine 17 points while rolling up 95 in the right direction. So clearly this is a UConn team not hailing from a big-time league by any stretch of the imagination that has not caught the attention uh, of odds makers or the casual fans. So look for UConn to win this game going away in an absolute landslide. Finally, guys, we've waited all show to show the Big Ten their love. And for this week, uh, we have Ohio State playing host to Iowa. Uh, it's the Buckeyes, 19 and a half point favorite pretty much across the board. There are some 20s out there. We are seeing the over take a little bit of money here on a Wednesday morning, 44 and a half leaking out to 46. Uh, and this is an Iowa team playing its first ranked opponent this season. Why is that important? Because Iowa didn't fare so well in these kind of games last year. They were outscored 92 to nothing in their three games when they took on ranked opponents. They've now lost seven straight games versus AP ranked foes, being outscored by an average of 27.3 points per game. Kirk Ferentz looking for his 200th career win with the Hawkeyes, which would break a tie with former University of Chicago head coach Amos Alonzo Stagg for the second most wins by head coach in Big Ten history. When we look at Iowa, though, they have shown a little bit more of a dynamic offense, and it's allowed them to become the third FBS team in the last 15 years to trail at the half and win by 17-plus points in back-to-back -back games, joining Northern Illinois in 2013 and Utah in 2020. Meanwhile, in steps the Scarlet and Gray, winners of their first four games by 30-plus points for the second time in program history. When we look at Ryan Day, 43-0 in his career versus unranked opponents, 42 of those wins have come by 10-plus points, 37 of them by 20-plus, and 29 by 30 plus they beat the Hawkeyes 54 to 10 back in 2022 it was actually the most points Iowa ever done a lot ever allowed in a game under Kirk Ferentz's leadership and Brad you know Ohio State offensively hasn't been pushed uh, we know that to be the case given the schedule that they face fourth most points per game though in the country fifth largest point per game increase of 18.3 in the FBS over the last two seasons jumping up Will Howard getting the ball out of his hands quickly 
to especially to a talented playmaker and freshman Jeremiah Smith. We've seen how dynamic their two-headed monster in the backfield can be. And in steps an Iowa defense that we know what they're capable of doing. They're led by their linebackers. They have defensive backs that check boxes, even if they've underwhelmed. But the one thing that you have to wonder for Iowa, they succumbed to the play-action pass when they took on Iowa State. Ohio State offensively against Iowa defense, no doubt, will be the matchup that everyone's watching in this ballgame. Yeah, and obviously edge to Ohio State's offense. I mean, just, you know, I always go back to Nick Saban. You know, good offense beats good defense anymore. And I'm not sure, you know, I'm anxious to see Iowa's defense. In some areas, I think it took a step back from from last season. We'll certainly get a better idea in this game. But obviously, Ohio State's offense, the competition's been questionable. Uh, Statistically, I mean, they're doing what they should be doing. They're number three in the country in yards per play, uh, points per game, five in yards per game. Will Howard has been what you expected, 12 in, in QBR, number 15 in weighted EPA per drop back. Or, you know, good quarterback play. I don't think Heisman quarterback play, certainly. Uh, he's only been sacked one time, so not a lot of pressure. You talked about him getting uh, getting rid of the ball quickly. Obviously, it helps when you got a ton of playmakers around you as much as anybody in the country. Judkins and Henderson at running back are averaging eight and a half yards per carry. Ohio State's number one in the country in EPA per rush. You mentioned Jeremiah Smith, uh, the true outstanding true freshman, five-star wide receiver, uh, top receiving grade so far among true freshmen. Uh, obviously, he leads the team, which is a little bit of a surprise considering you had an All-American caliber, and uh, Igbuka is just behind him, averaging 17 yards per catch. Carnell Tate's their third option. He'd be number one at most Power 5 programs. Uh, and and I, I bring him up because – Watching Iowa's tape, you mentioned that, you know, succumbing to the play action. Boy, I'd be really concerned if I'm Iowa uh, on that cornerback position opposite Harris. Um, I'd really, if I'm the Buckeyes, I'm going right after that Deshaun Lee. He's number eight. Um, it was susceptible in, in, in more than a few plays against Minnesota. And if you, you're giving that up to Minnesota's passing game, I can only imagine what, you know, the, even if Smith or Ibuka get, gets taken away from, from Harris at the one side, I mean, Ibuka and Tater are going to eat here in this game, in my opinion, uh, to say the least. I will say that the Buckeyes' offensive line looks improved. To me, it's still kind of a question mark. They're still trying to figure out the right guard position. They've been going back and forth with a couple guys still. You like to figure that out, uh, obviously, before next week's big game against Oregon. Iowa's, Iowa's defense, obviously, is the best Ohio State's faced. Number four in rush defense, trying to keep things in front of them. Although... Not as good last year uh, because they've given up some explosives. Number 29th in the country in yards per play allowed. They were number one last year. Uh, they kept the scoring down for the most part. They haven't faced uh, you know, uh, anything like what they'll see uh, on Saturday as far as playmakers in space. Uh, obviously, there were some particular – I thought it was – a little bit different. They were playing just one single safety in their last game in Minnesota. Can't play that way against Ohio State. I, I'm not sure why they even put that on tape, to be honest with you. That, and, you know, the, the, the announcer of the, the, the Penn State quarterback, his name's uh, escaping me, NBC, I can't think of it. But he he was questioning it even. Like, well, well, I, he didn't understand Todd Blackledge. Uh, he, he didn't understand it. So I, I certainly don't expect to see those looks here. I, I will say this, re-listening to the Big Ten podcast, I feel bad because you guys caught some strays because I was <laughs> it's very negative on Ohio State. Reality is they were number two in my power ratings. They're still number two in my power ratings. I was negative because I was grading them on the scale of national title or bust, the scale of some people saying this is – the most talented roster in college football in several years, the scale of you paid $30 million to construct this roster, more than any in the history of college football. And I got to tell you, uh, I got to see more. There's been times, and Payne will break it down on the other side, where I haven't seen the best team in college football in the last five years. I'll just put it that way. I, I mean, on, on the other side, Michigan State was moving the football last week. If we're going to see it, I guess, from Ohio State, this provides, I'm not going to say a tune-up because I don't think they'll get caught looking past Iowa, but no doubt for their trip out to Austin Stadium to take on Oregon, a game that everyone had circled in the Big Ten before the season started. And Payne, Brad mentioned you know, some of the questions that we have. Iowa offensively, uh, a massive point-per-game increase over what we've seen the last couple of seasons. 31 points versus Minnesota, snapped a streak of 13 straight conference games, scoring under 30 points. 
I know four games isn't exactly a large sample, but Iowa's 53rd nationally with 32 points per game and 65th in the country, averaging just shy of 400 yards per game. They've been able to run the football effectively behind Caleb Johnson. Cade McNamara has basically served as a glorified game manager, as illustrated with a 62 passing yard performance against the Minnesota Golden Gophers. But Johnson's an Ohio kid, hasn't shied away from how important a win against the Buckeyes would be. In steps an Ohio State defense, who has done what you'd expect him to do given the schedule of opponents they faced allowing 6.8 points per game, fewest points per game allowed by Ohio State through four games since 1964. Their defense has only gotten better after the break, but dare I say this is the first actual test that Ohio State will see from a defensive standpoint come Saturday. (laughs) Brad mentioned the Michigan State game last week, and and kudos to Jonathan Smith and, and that staff. They came out with a very nice game plan, a great script, um, you know, before the game reached garbage time, or you just look in the first half, I mean, a, a, a success rate that is well above the national average and you're supposedly facing this this elite Ohio State defense. So I saw a little bit of what what Brad saw, and I think as you kind of circle it into this game, you give Tim Lester some some credit. Iowa's offense has certainly improved in all of the little things we talk about, right? Motion rates are up. That's that's helped the explosive run rates for Caleb Johnson. 22% of Caleb's runs have gone 10-plus yards. Turnover-worthy plays are down. So Iowa isn't beating themselves or or putting their defense in in poor spots with, with opposing teams starting and with short field situations. The discussion we had during the Iowa preview was, can the Hawkeyes go from a bottom-five offense in the entire country to somewhere you know inside the top 100 that'd be some material improvement right now Iowa is a top 90 schedule adjusted offense so more than on pace for our our season long goal Ohio State is a completely different animal and and I think it will be in the shoe come Saturday afternoon and especially after that uh not the greatest performance last week for for the defense especially up front had trouble getting off some blocks and I know Iowa fans are probably thinking the reason Ohio State hasn't reached their ceiling in recent years is because they've been bullied in the biggest games, and and, and that's true. I'm interested to see if Iowa has the offensive line to do that. The players have graded out well, but as a team outside our top 70 and offensive line yards created, Ohio State seems to be somewhat gap sound and disciplined, but they don't create a ton of tackles for loss, uh, but they don't give up the explosive run either. And and I was lived on that a little bit. Ohio State secondary, <laughs> we'll look at this Iowa receiver group, and I just probably not feel threatened downfield. Hawkeyes are outside the top 100 in explosive pass rate. So let's say Iowa finds relative success on the ground early. I would just assume Jim Knowles starts walking down his safeties, right? Downs and ransom into the box. We saw the adjustment in that Cyhawk game from Iowa State. And it changed the com- just the complexity of the game, right? Iowa State started to load the box in that second half. Iowa could not do a thing the final seven possessions of the game. And so I would assume either it starts that way or it's a very short leash on, on you know, attempting to stop the run with, with six, six guys in the box. The one area I'd like to see Iowa attack a little bit is, is using those tight ends in Ostranga and, and Lachey. Tim Lester... Has, you know, Cade McNamara throwing with play action more this season? It's up to 33%. I think the question area of the Buckeyes defense coming into the season was was linebacker, right? They lost Eichenberg and Chambers. Sonny Styles hasn't really been tested, but when he has, allowing 8.3 yards per target, we've seen Ohio State's linebackers at times struggle with eye discipline. So, you know, for Iowa to stick within this number, and it seems to be growing this morning a little bit, now out to 20 a lot of places, you'll need Colby and Dunker and Jones and, and Richmond to have, you know, a dominant impact up front for Iowa's offensive line against that 4-2 Ohio State front. That's really the only way. Iowa's offensive line just has to win that battle up front. Caleb Johnson, you mentioned returning home, has to be special. And then Tim Lester's motion rates have to be effective enough to to hinder those Ohio State linebackers. There just aren't, you know, a ton of paths here. And, and that's the reality of it. Somehow you got to get that ground game going and, and be the bigger man up front. 
and then get the play action game going put those Ohio State linebackers in conflict you mentioned the number remaining pretty steady on the side the total largely has done that a prominent shop out here in the desert open a little bit lower at 42 uh, but we haven't seen much movement on the total either at 45 and a half. Don't want to put you guys on the spot, but in terms of, you know, where you think with the market's going, I would be hard pressed to make a case this gets back to 21. I would have to imagine that with such a low total, Iowa would take money there. I guess for me, I'm fascinated to see where the total settles. If we do get as high as a key of 47 at the top, I know not as big in college as the NFL, or if it trends down below the 45 into that 44, 44 and a half range. Getting some public sentiment uh, on Iowa overs. I get asked about it every week on Twitter. Four and zero the over compared yeah, to yeah, four and zero to the over the yeah. last year. Great and Todd for identifying <laughs> that. By the way, he's he was been asking me about Iowa overs the first couple of weeks of the season. We of course haven't bet any. Nope. I, maybe you have, nope, Todd. I have but not yeah, been, I've not been. On you one. were ahead of the curve on that. I have not been on one against <laughs> Iowa State where I wanted to make the play. And then uh, against Minnesota, didn't pull the trigger either. So, which inevitably means if I do bet over, I'll let you guys know this game will end 34 to 10 and come in under by the slimmest of margins. <laughs> because that is how things work in this particular space, as we all know as sports bettors. You can follow Brad on social media at Brad Power 7. Uh, you can follow Payne there as well at Payne Insider. I'm Todd Furman. Follow me. Most importantly, as always, for all things Bet the Board related, for your NFL, college football, and NASCAR playoff needs, be sure to follow the podcast at Bet the Board Pod. And, gentlemen, it's the best bet portion of the program. Uh, I feel a lot of our listeners probably were able to get to the window, especially if they waited to listen to the podcast until Friday as the Cincinnati price tag drifted out from where we gave it out at plus three across the market out to three and a half, grabbing a better number than me. Uh, so always glad to see that. Can we keep the hot streak going, Payne? Uh, where are we going as far as our landscape is considered this weekend in college football? Well, there's a couple options of which we discussed with Brad pregame, and uh, they all seemed fitting. There's one that I think we, we feel slightly better about. I just don't know if it's getting worked on as we as we speak so there will be a better number available so ultimately your call either the one i texted you or the one you slightly prefer i think that's not at the ultimate best price that we're going to see uh, well that's the uh, that's the catch 22 <laughs> that we find ourselves in do we go full game uh, on that one or do we go a, a first half number that's out there so while the work is being done, I'm flipping it right back to you. I'm going to let you make. Okay, the I decision. figured I figured you were going to do <laughs> well, that. Because, so. Look, I don't want to be the one that ruins the work that's getting done, but I do yeah. like full game sometimes better than first half. From an I do, standpoint. I do as well. I will, I do as well. All right, fi- why don't we just? Well, the, the market right now is a mix between six and a half minus fifteen and, and like seven plus. I, it, your call. All right, your call. I don't. You, you pick. All right, that's fine. We're going full game then because that's what we said before. We okay. were going to do three twenty. Yeah, we'll do that uh, because okay. we said we were trying to avoid some of the first half availability. So yeah, let's do three twenty. Yes. Okay, there you go. We're we're not going to screw this up. This is going to be all you. We're going three twelve, uh, three twenty Louisville. There is six minus fifteen out there. Uh, we can for great. I think that's where it's being worked on to go. Uh, if we want to just grade it at seven plus a hundred, that's fine too. Whatever you're good yeah, with. Yeah, we'll grade grading. it. We'll grade it at seven. Even okay. shop. Our listeners okay. know to shop around and, you know, hopefully if they have the opportunity for a cheap buy off of the seven down to six and a half or what's widely available at minus six and a half. Yeah, there's, minus there's some at the last. Yeah. yeah. There's some, yeah. The last, well, the last, we uh, got, we got to be careful about show. the last for us because it's the current for others. That, ah, uh, that, that is true. That is true. Okay. I'm going to let you talk about it. I'm not going to going to change up the karma. Right. We're going 320 so Louisville. You, you break it down. We will go with the Louisville Cardinals in this spot. Look, Louisville was the better team in the box score last week against Notre Dame. Uh, they were done in by some short fields and some turnover misfortune for a team that hadn't shown uh, the knack for turning it over at all through the early portion of the campaign. Uh, we talked at great lengths about how we thought that there could be a regression for Louisville going into the Notre Dame game, knowing that they were fortunate the week before against Georgia Tech. Uh, but this, for me, is as much a play against SMU in this spot as anything else. You look at SMU over the last couple weeks. Yes, on the scoreboard, 66-42 against TCU looks great, but they gained less than 400 yards in that spot against the Horn Frogs defense that leaves an awful lot to be desired. Last week, it was a game where I think all three of us were in agreement. SMU was outplayed in the first half in a primetime setting against Florida State, an early turnover in the second half, and things snowballed. And while I know karma doesn't play a big role in all of this, SMU is pounding their chest an awful lot on social media 
uh, after dispatching the Seminoles. I wonder, going into this spot with an offense that's been a little bit limited in terms of their passing game against this Louisville defensive front, if they'll be able to show some balance. But more importantly for Louisville, Brad pointed out, you know, Tyler Shuck looked the part. It's a quarterback that we've been high on through multiple stops at Oregon and Texas Tech. Durability has been the biggest concern, not his capabilities. But more important for Louisville offensively, you're starting to see all of their weapons get healthy and emerge. We knew Ja'Cory Brooks was their alpha. He's been the common denominator. You look at Chris Bell, who we mentioned as a big play threat, didn't do a ton against Notre Dame, but now they have a running mate in Colin Lacey who finally flashed last week. I look at this SMU team, and while I think their defense is good, I don't think they're ready to go on the road and travel against an offense that can be this dynamic. Louisville will create some balance. This can be a very difficult place to play, and I think they get a huge bounce back performance, forcing SMU to throw to play catch up. Things will snowball. Uh, I think Louisville wins this game by double digits. Boom. There we go. You guys have anything? You- I feel bad. I feel bad for Brad having to listen to the mental gymnastics of arriving at that game. So I, I probably feel bad for some of our listeners as well. well but they, hopefully- I think they'd like us to pull back the curtain a little bit more than we already do. And <laughs> that uh, is true. We try and stay as buttoned up, forward facing as we possibly can. But anything else, gentlemen, that you guys would like to share? I know we covered the marquee games again. Want to thank our listeners for contributing in that listener poll. Looking at the schedule for next week, I don't think the listeners will have any questions in terms of what games we're going to cover, and I don't think we're going to. Have- have to lean into them voting to try and find the fifth candidate uh arguably the best saturday of college football naturally for me of course that's the one saturday in the fall i have a wedding but that's a me problem not for you guys or listeners jesus really try and deal with, yeah thankfully oh. thankfully it's local it's adjacent to a casino so i may or may not be able to duck out and uh, oh. disappear for yeah, two and a half three start, hours yeah yeah, once they say I do, you just mosey on yeah, right I mean, across the that, street. That's kind of my take. But anything else you guys wanted to add in terms of other games that you're interested in watching this weekend uh, or things that you're keeping tabs on as these teams start to show us their true colors? No. All right. I will take the silence is golden around these parts. So best of luck to all of our loyal Bet the Board listeners uh, with all of their investments this week. And in terms of where we see ourselves getting to the window, we're back in the Yukon Huskies again for the second straight week and the Louisville Cardinal minus the touchdown against SMU. And come Saturday afternoon, we'll see you at the window. We hope you enjoyed listening to this episode of Bet the Board. Make sure you follow Todd and Payne on X. Todd is at Todd Furman. That's T O D D F U H R M A N. And Payne is at Payne Insider. That's P A Y N E I N S I D E R. Don't forget, our weekly newsletter comes with an additional best bet. Have that delivered to your inbox by clicking the link atop the podcast show notes. And most importantly, subscribe and download Bet the Board. We're on Apple, Spotify, Amazon Wondery. YouTube, Google Podcasts, and all your other major platforms.